Today's episode is called, You Were Made for More Than Chaos. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. I don't know how much chaos you are in right now. We have everyday chaos, which is just the grocery shopping, the laundry, the cleaning, the cooking, the school events, the work, the hassle and the hustle and the bustle of life. That's the chaos that we never get away from. Doesn't matter how old you are. As long as you're living at home, you're gonna have those things. If you aren't able to do them anymore and you go to the nursing home, There's a different kinds of everyday chaos, like waiting for someone to come help you get ready for the day or waiting for someone to help you with the bathroom or waiting for someone to take you to the bath. Those everyday chaos things, those are the stressors of life. We're never, like I said, going to get away from them until we go home to be with the Lord in heaven. Then there's sort of the um, like special events or holiday kind of chaos. That's like when you have a Christmas celebration coming up or Thanksgiving or a birthday party that you're preparing for. They're the special services those of us who work in the church plan for and prepare for and get all the things together for decorating and all that sort of thing. So there's that. But then there's sort of the God help me chaos. And that's the, I just lost a job or a sudden or a not so sudden death. Those things kind of are like the rug being swept out from underneath us. And we're sort of left reeling for a little bit, trying to get our bearings again and figure out where we're at. I want to direct you today to Isaiah 58 verse 11. It says this, And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and give strength to your bones, and you will be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Notice all those ands. It's like God so relishes being the giver. He will give you this, and, and, and. (laughs) He doesn't want to just give you a little. He blesses us with abundance. And what does he tell us he will give us? He will guide us. What is that? It's to show. It's to advise. It's to influence us. He's not going to leave us wandering on our own, trying to figure out which paths to take, which is the best road, which is the um, least dangerous way that we should go. He will satisfy us. That is to meet our expectations, our desires. It's to fulfill and to provide. Such an important thing. When we are left weary and overwhelmed and wondering, where am I going to get my rest? Or how am I going to get through this? God says, don't worry. I I will satisfy you. I'm not going to leave you longing for more or wondering where you can get what you need. I'm here. I'm happy to satisfy you. And then, of course, he's going to strengthen us. He's going to make us strong. I rely on this all the time. So as I go to work, I get up very early in the morning to go to work. I get up at 4 a.m. And I can't tell you how many times I either didn't sleep the night before or didn't get enough sleep the night before or just feel weary from the week. You know, by day four or five of working, I'm just sort of feeling, you know, run down And I'll get up and I'll start making my cup of coffee and I'll put some praise music on softly as I'm getting ready. And I notoriously am asking God for the strength to get through the day. Like, God, I know I can't do this. I'm feeling run down. I I need your strength. I need your help. And every single time without fail, he does that. I have the strength that I need. I get to work and I'm able to just keep going and I finally get home and I might not be worth much when I get home, but he gives me the strength that I need for each step of the way. We don't have to live as frazzled, stressed out, overwhelmed, 
like falling into the chaos people when we have God who is willing to provide these things for us. He says he's going to guide us. He's going to satisfy us. He's going to strengthen us. He is going to be our sanctuary so that we can be a sanctuary, a place of refuge and rest to the other people in the world. And that's huge because that's what we all long for. We will be very attractive to other people if despite the chaos of life, we can be even keeled. If even though things are sort of falling apart around us, we can be like, I mean, I'm just trusting in God. I don't know where the money is going to come from. I just wake up every day and I'm like, Lord, I'm here. If you have you know, a job you want me to do, if there's somewhere I need to go, something I need to be doing, you show me, you let me know. Um, or God will provide one way or the other. When our kids were little, I was shown this in a dramatic fashion. We relied on hand-me-downs tons of times when my kids were little. And I was staying at home. My husband was working. We were living on his paycheck. And I remember having a vacation coming up. I think it was even um, like a school um, sports tournament or something that we were going to be going to. And one of my kids didn't have a swimming suit. And I remember just thinking, oh man, like I'm going to have to go out and find a swimming suit before we go. And a box of hand-me-downs came from a woman that my husband was working with at the time. And there was not one, but three swimming suits in that child size. Now, granted, I wasn't picky about it. I didn't pick out those swimming suits. Those might not have been the color that I would have chosen. Might not have been exactly the smile. There might have been ruffles and things that I wouldn't have necessarily chosen. But still, because my daughter and I were able and willing to just take what we were given, God provided dramatically. And that's such a small, small, tiny example. But it was just a reminder for me during that time that God was watching out for me. And he knew these silly little tiny needs, not just the huge needs, like I need money to pay the rent, or I need to make the house payment, or I need to make sure that I have the money that I need for groceries. He is there to provide even the silly little things that we maybe don't even consider worthy to ask God about. He sees, <laughs> he knows. So we don't have to run around like a crazy person, like a chicken with their head cut off, wondering, oh man, how am I going to get through this? We just need to turn to God. We just need to say, God, I know that you will do this. I know that you see me and that you know my needs and I'm looking to you because you are faithful and you love us and you love to provide for your children. Um, Psalm 1 is an interesting passage that kind of piggybacks off of Isaiah. Psalm 1 would have been written before Isaiah, but um, Isaiah saying that we will be like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. It reminded me of Psalm 1, which says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. I looked this passage up in the People's Bible, and it said to notice the characteristics of the godly. What do they do? They resist sin. They don't sit in the way uh, in the in the seat of mockers, they love God's word and they produce the fruits of faith. Just a couple things about that, and then we're going to come back to producing the fruits of faith. So I don't know if you noticed I did when I read Psalm one the progression. They do not walk with the wicked, stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. There's a progression there. Walking 
in the way of the world, keeping in step with the way of the world. That's to be like, you know, at least taking notice of the way of the world. When we stand, we're slowing down and we're sort of absorbing, right? When, so now we're not just walking with the world, but we're sort of standing there like, hey, what do they have to say? What would you say about this? How am I supposed to feel about this? And then sitting in the city of mockers or in the company of mockers is to be like, okay, these are my people, right? I'm sitting with them. I'm here with them. I'm communing with them. I'm fellowshipping with them. And it's an easy progression for any of us to make. You know, we think that we're just going to watch this TV show or we're just going to listen to this radio station and it's not going to, you know, make an impact on us. We're just... We're just going to listen to the music for the beat. And we like to hear what the kids are listening to. And, you know, there's no harm, no foul. Or we watch this series on Netflix. Everybody is saying it's phenomenal. And so, yeah, there is a lot of sex in it or a lot of pretty bad language. But, you know, I'm above that. I can, I can block that out. And pretty soon those things become commonplace. They become normalized in our brain. And we're left, you know, thinking nothing of it. Whereas at first, if we are, you know, in tune to God and his ways, when we see something that's very different from that, it sort of is like a shock to our system or we, our conscience is, is pricked a little bit and we're, we're left going, wait a second. Oh, shouldn't say that. Or how dare they use God's name like that? It's a very easy thing to do, and it's something that we always have to be on our guard against because the way of blessing, as we see in the psalm, is in avoiding that, resisting sin, not sitting and standing and walking in the ways of the world, but rather on delighting on the law of God, which is not just his commands and not just the laws, but the whole of his word. That's what that means in that situation. And meditating on it day and night, not just on Sunday morning, not just giving God one hour a week, meditating on it, thinking it over, mulling it over, writing it out, journaling it, praying it, delighting, taking delight, finding um, it to be precious, God's laws, God's ways, God's word. It's what God thinks. It is being taken right into the mind of God. When we open up our Bibles and read, and that person, that person who meditates on God's laws, who, you know, continues to take delight in God's word, that's a person like someone, like a tree planted by a stream. It's not going to wither. <laughs> when, the, when the drought comes, when you suddenly are left without a paycheck, or when sickness strikes, or when death comes to someone you are close to, you're not going to wither. You're not going to dry up and wither. You're going to stand firm. You're going to have a solid ground to stand on because you're standing with God. Not so the people of the world. They don't have that steady foundation that we have when we are solidly standing and walking and sitting with God. Um, that fruit, that the bearing the fruit of faith, you know, I couldn't help but think of Pastor Mike's book, What's Big Start Small. If you haven't taken a look at it yet, what a great Christmas present. Put it on your list. Take the time to read it. He takes one parable, the parable of the sower, and he breaks it down. And I've told him privately that I think we need more of this. <laughs> I wish he would do a whole lot more of this because here is just one little episode in the in the Bible. It's one little account that takes up a few paragraphs. And Pastor Mike breaks it down into, you know, what are the threats to our faith? What are the things that we need to avoid if we want to bear fruit? And look, at the end of the day, so much of what we do doesn't matter. But bearing fruit for the kingdom, being a person of prayer, being a person who can gladly profess their faith to an unbeliever to show them a different way, to rescue them from the fire that this world is taking people to, just the fires of hell, just snatching them from that and really working in God's kingdom, being a warrior for God. Um, it was just such a refreshing book that really showed me a different way. And 
I have told many people that it's well worth your time to read, think about, dwell on, meditate on, again, because it's just really breaking it down into applicable terms for us today. Um, what more? Well, at the bottom of the day, at the end of the day, we don't need to cling to the chaos. We don't need to let the the chaos mandate how we live. You know, when someone calls you and says, hey, how you doing? You don't need to tell them all the chaos. Chaos is a part of life. So we don't need to sit and say, well, this happened and then this happened. And if that wasn't bad enough, this happened. You know what you can say? I'm doing fine. God's watching out for me. He's always provided. He's faithful. I know he's going to come through. I'm great. How are you? How can I pray for you? Is there anything you need? That's going to be a totally different conversation than someone who is easily flustered. Someone who is easily like that chaff in the wind, just blowing here, there, and everywhere. Just, you know, going with whatever the day brings. When the news says this, oh my goodness, you just tremble with fear. Or if the news says this, then you have to, you know, search and see if that rumor is true. Not not for the people of God. Jesus said this, it was recorded in John 14, verse 27. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God gives us peace. That means we can trust. That means we don't have to fret. We don't need to fear. We don't need to tremble. But we can trust God's character, who he is. We can trust his promises what he tells us in his word that he will be with us that he does love us that nothing escapes his his eyesight that his eye is on the sparrow and his eye is on us and we can trust that he's not going to let us just go he's going to watch for us he's going to do what's best in our life it's a much different thing this has been little things because in god's kingdom the little things are the big things